Hello, welcome to the Tuesday, August 15th, 2017 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Quite often you may have asked yourself why anti-malware software isn't better in sort of identifying these generic obfuscation techniques that we often see with malware. Well, uh, today we have a nice diary with an example why that doesn't work. In this particular case, the email that arrived uh, was malicious looking it did use a lot of the tricks that we see in malware and the landing page that you went to when you clicked on the link uh, well it also used heavily obfuscated javascript but in the end it just ended up to be spam now you may consider this type of spam malicious as well but by most definition there is a difference between spam and malware and malware engines try to not sort of overstep their bounds in order to avoid being blamed for false positives and we definitely had plenty of them in the past as well so interesting example how not all obfuscated JavaScript is outright malicious. In this case also, we have again one of these new top level domains. I think it was dot world showing yet again that there's probably little need to resolve these domains and you may actually gain some spam filter in this case or maybe even block the occasional piece of malware if you don't resolve these new top level domains. And researchers at the University of Oxford have come up with an interesting new technique how malware could sneak its way into additional privileges on Android. Now, the paper really talks about Android, but the authors mention that in principle, the same technique is also possible on iOS. Essentially, what they're talking about is that multiple applications on a phone will share common libraries. That's very common practice that a particular library is only installed once and then shared between different applications. But both the Android and the iOS permission system does not clearly differentiate between permissions assigned to an application and a library. So what happens is that a library that's used by multiple applications does gain the privileges of all of these applications combined. So what a malicious application can do is it can use a library that uh, was installed by a trusted application that was given a lot of privileges because it was installed with a trusted application and then essentially the malicious software can abuse some of these privileges by just loading this library and taking advantage of this library. Pretty interesting paper and uh, we'll see where this ends up. They did see some of this already being used in the wild. Now they're focusing here on adware but uh, we'll have to see if that actually will also apply it to malicious software. And mobile security company Lookout has identified a number of Android applications, some of which have also been distributed via Google's Play Store that do not only provide access to the Telegraph anonymous communication protocol, but they're also exfiltrating significant amounts of personal data. Lookout calls this the Sonic Spy family of uh, spyware and they identified 73 different remote instructions that can be executed via this particular malicious software. Overall, the technique to sort of add malicious functionality like this to otherwise useful and popular applications is certainly somewhat typical for Android. Kind of sad that again, the automatic checks in Google's Play Store did not really catch this, but the majority of the samples that Lookout discovered were not distributed via Google's Play Store. 
Now, a couple of weeks ago, when Troy Hunt uh, released uh, the list of passwords that he collected over the years, I forgot to mention actually that this list that he released wasn't clear text, it was hashes. Now, that's of course in order to keep these passwords somewhat safe, but it does limit a bit uh, how you can use these passwords in order to audit your own user's passwords. So for example, if you're using Active Directory, then the passwords are hashed using Windows own system and you can't just simply compare the hashes. Well, there's now an interesting DLL someone came up with in order to solve this problem. Apparently in Windows, you can call a custom filter DLL once a password is being changed and that filter DLL can then apply further operations to the password that the user entered. So at this point, the password is in clear text. You can then, of course, calculate the SHA hash and then verify it with Troy Hunt's table whether or not this particular password already leaked. Source code for this DLL is available, so you may have to compile it yourself, but you can also review the source code to make sure that nothing bad happens to the password, in addition to it being compared to Troy Hunt's list. Well, uh, this is it for today, so thanks for listening and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.